All right, welcome everybody. Why closure? Uh, why closure is probably striking you as a little bit of a strange topic to talk about at a closure conference because hopefully most people have an answer to the question uh, why closure that applies to themselves. Uh, in my case, why closure is a question that I'm asked a lot. And why are people always asking me why closure? So rewind a little bit more than a year. Uh, I co-founded the company. I'm the uh, CTO and co-founder of a brand new company. and. Uh, and so when you start a new company, um, you've got a bunch of really hard decisions to make. And uh, one decision you have to make is you have to choose a technology stack. And a major component of that technology stack is a language. And there's a lot of perspectives on what language you choose for a startup, right? There's, there's a category of languages that are sort of in your, in your startup friendly class, right? So if I said, we're going to use Ruby or Python, I probably wouldn't get, why Ruby? Why Python, right? Those are sort of just accepted, like, yeah, it's a startup. So of course you're using something like uh, Ruby or Python. Um, I could choose something like you know, Java or Scala, and I might, I might get that question, like, why Java? That's, not, that's more like big company enterprise stuff, not really startup stuff. Um, but I still think I would get that question less often um, than if I chose something like closure. That's, that's a little bit off the menu, right? Whether you're thinking, it through, thinking about it uh, through the lens of you're starting a startup or you've got a big company, like, closure's an unconventional choice. So a lot of people ask me this question. Uh, and everybody has a perspective, right? There's, there's, different, there's different ways of, of looking at this decision uh, of what language to use when you start your company, uh, but nobody questions that it's an important one, right? And, and so some people will say, you know, you start with the startup y language, and then, like, if you can get the company working, then maybe you've earned the right to switch to a boring language that'll actually work, right? And this becomes, this is like, this is something you hear, right? And like, this gets written up, right? Oh, Twitter is like failing left and right, but uh, they had to throw away their startup move fast language and go to something lame and boring, but now the site works, cool. Um, and so, you know, this kind of becomes part of people's thinking. And so um, there's, there's almost this, you know, this, this pull towards, okay, yeah, that's what people do, right? They, they have the hacky founder code language, um, and then eventually they like, you know, switch to something real and boring and then they're a lame big company and nobody wants to work there and everybody leaves. I'm not talking about Twitter. Um, <laughs> so, so I want to talk a little bit uh, about our company. It's called Amparity. Uh, we basically build uh, a large scale data processing platform that helps customers unify really large amounts of consumer data uh, even when it doesn't fit together cleanly. So it's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty at scale data crunchy uh, problem. Um, we are located in Seattle, uh, where the weather is much nicer than here in Portland, um, you should all know. Um, we, are, uh, we are fortunate enough to, uh, to have a nice view of the Space Needle um, out, the, out the door of our office. Uh, we are VC funded, uh, and, and I mention this because there are different categories of startups, and um, there is the category of startup where we want to start a startup because that's cool and fun, and we're going to build a little lifestyle business, and you know, our goal is to kind of get enough revenue that we can sustain and do things our way and have a lot of fun. Um, and that's, that's a perfectly reasonable choice. Um, our choice, being a VC-funded company, is we want to build the biggest company that we possibly can, right? So we're really going for it. And, uh, and that adds a lot of weight to the decision about what technology we use. We're not a small company uh, because we want to stay a small company. We're a small company trying to become a very large company. So there's a lot at stake. Um, and of course, we chose Clojure um, as the foundational language for our company. So why Clojure? Uh, I promise this is not going to be a three minute long talk, um, but I'm going to actually answer this question um, right away. Um, so why Clojure from our perspective? And this is my thinking in starting the company, right? Why Clojure? If I choose one of those mainstream options, I'm not going to get questioned, right? People aren't going to say, why Python? It'll be accepted. Um, so I had to really be thoughtful and sort of build a rationale. Why closure? Um, so here's what was in my head. Um, I thought to myself, you know what? This is the best of both worlds. Why, why choose Ruby uh, or Python so I can go really fast and get dynamism uh, and REPL orientation um, and all these wonderful things, but then kind of throw out the robustness and scale um, of this other boring technology, right? With closure, you've got a little bit of a knob. You can tune, right? You can be a really dynamic uh, when you're using Clojure, but you can also um, orient more uh, towards performance and robustness and scale. Um, that's a nice knob to have, right? Because as you're a startup, you're shifting from hack it out, get it working mode to something that needs to be really robust at scale. And of course, the inherent nature of our problem is one uh, at very large scale. So it seemed to me um, like 
you know, kind of a cheat, right? I, get, I can sort of get the benefits of both sides uh, if I use Clojure. Um, it's simple and it's data oriented. Um, the problem our company's trying to solve is data oriented. Uh, I, I have a pretty strong belief from a couple decades of software development experience that less code is better, and I think data orientation does correlate with smaller code bases, and I think um, if you want to continue moving fast after you sort of get out of that early stage uh, of, of, the, of the startup phase, uh, you know, you need something that's, that's simple. Um, you can't be, you know, pushing around hundreds of thousands of lines of code all the time and, and, and still stay agile. Um, and the last piece, uh, is I was firmly, <laughs> firmly convicted that smart people um, want to use Clojure. And I think you know, creating an opportunity for smart people to use Clojure um, on a daily basis and get paid for it um, seemed like a pretty compelling pitch for the company. Um, so that's it. That's why Clojure. That's what was in my head. Um, I'd like to spend the rest of this talk talking about what happens next. Right? So we've been building the company for more than a year. Um, we're a pretty large company, right? So we've got uh, more than a dozen people um, full-time writing, writing Clojure, which is, which is larger than average uh, in the Clojure ecosystem. Um, so I kind of want to talk to you about what happens as you scale Clojure. Um, with this sort of planted as our rationale, um, then you go out and try and build a company. What happens? Um, so the first category of things you need to think about are, of course, people, right? You need people to build a company, you need people to write the code. Uh, and you know, I, I sort of stated in my rationale, I, I think smart people want to use it. Um, and, and that's definitely true. Uh, smart people do want to use Clojure. But the reality is smart people also want to use all of those other languages. And there's a lot more people who are using those other languages who already know those other languages, right? So um, yeah, smart people want to use Clojure, but you have a smaller pool. Um, so so there's, there's a trade-off there. Um, I think that People who are smart want to use Clojure. I do think that you get a little bit more passion from Clojure. I think that's something that kind of comes with Clojure being a smaller community. Um, this person works at our company. Uh, they've literally got Clojure permanently tattooed on their body. So I think there's, there's a certain level of passion um, around the language. And that's a great thing to be able to capture, right? When you're building a company, having people who are really enthusiastic about the tech that you're using is an asset, um, and that's really good. And, and I think um, you know, the other side of the, of the, of the trade-off in terms of the overall pool of people is there's a smaller pool of companies who've decided to use Clojure. So you do get a little bit of benefit in relative terms uh, in, in the hiring market, um, but it's something to be aware of. Uh, because Clojure is a smaller community relative to, to the more mainstream languages, um, you also have less opportunity to build an entirely local startup, right? And there are examples of Clojure companies that are fully remote. I've seen Clojure companies that are fully local. Um, but when you're a company like ours and you're trying to, to build to scale pretty quickly, um, you have to be considered. You have to make that choice very early on. Are we going to be remote only, local only, or somewhere in between? Uh, and there's many different versions of somewhere in between. Um, the answer is not always obvious. And the closure community, this is sort of the, the heat map of closure, um, closure searches from, from Google Trends. It's pretty distributed around the world. There's kind of not, oh, well, everyone who uses closures in San Francisco, and then um, you know, there's small communities everywhere. It's very distributed. So, um, so we're in Seattle. Closure developers are everywhere. Um, what did we decide? We went for the somewhere in between. And so uh, we have a handful of people on our team that work remotely from a variety of different places. Um, and it's worked pretty well. Uh, part of the reason it's worked pretty well uh, is because technology is better uh, for remote working than it has been in the past. I think you know, this would have been a little bit iffier uh, even just six or seven years ago. Um, I, I think there were, there were more um, just pure technology challenges. So uh, you know, improvements in, in VC and, and, and bandwidth and, and things like Slack have all been very helpful in, in, in making it work. Um, so, uh, and, and, and by the way, the remote uh, work investments you make uh, to make it nice for people who are always remote to work in your company is also pretty nice when there's a snow day in the office uh, because it gives people the opportunity to have a close to first class working experience uh, when for one reason or another they can't make it to the office. So great, right? It's all upside. You get access to all the talent in the world. Um, you can still have your headquarters. Well, it's, it's, it's not quite so straightforward, right? There's a lot of downside. There are, there are reasons that uh, companies, and, and frankly, the vast majority of companies, are local only, or at least strongly local first, right? There's something about 
uh, building that community, right? Why, why are you here at this conference? You know, you could go, you could stay home, and then tonight all the videos are going to be online, right? You don't have to be here, but you come here to engage and be part of the community. And it's, you know, a lot of people say, well, I come for the hallway conversations. Well, in the office, that's where those hallway conversations happen, right? So, so it's, it's an important thing to be aware of, and, and we are very vocal um, when we're hiring a remote employee. We say, you're getting a second class experience. And you don't get to like be in the office when all the puppies show up, um, or when we do a push-up party, or when we go out and have fun and build community together. And those things are really important because startups are hard. They're really, really hard. And those, those chances to get to know each other as people and, and bond together, I think, are, uh, are really important in helping you get through it. So there's a lot of burden on the remote employee to engage themselves uh, and to, and, and to kind of understand that I'm going to see a picture of a bunch of people in Seattle who got together and built these terrariums, and I didn't get to be a part of that, right? Um, so it's really important um, that both sides be thoughtful um, about what the trade-offs are there. Uh, what about if you run out of people, right? Uh, what if there aren't enough people in market to hire? Um, you know, what are you left with? Well, you know, not all smart developers uh, use Clojure exclusively, right? There's a lot of smart people um, who are willing to use Clojure but don't use Clojure yet. And um, we found that that's actually been um, very effective for us is to find people, uh, one of whom is in this room, who haven't used Clojure before but we know they're, they're a great developer and just teach Clojure to them. Um, in fact, it's worked so well, we've done it with about half of our team. Uh, so this is actually the distribution of closure experience um, within sort of the, the, the core of our team. Um, and half of our team came here uh, without real world closure experience. Maybe they've dabbled a little bit, but no actual like used it for a company. So um, this ratio has been very effective. Um, I do want to highlight having, um, having you know, two or three people on your team that have a ton of closure experience is really, really valuable, right? Because you need, you need people who've kind of been way past the honeymoon period and kind of seen, seen around some of those corners that you have a little bit of trouble seeing when you're taking on a technology that's, that's relatively new. But if you have a really good core of people who know closure really well and they kind of understand the responsibility that comes with that, um, you can absolutely train people in closure. And, and the reality is what we found time and time again is that when we bring somebody in and, and teach them closure, um, that's a very tiny amount of their onboard time, right? There's so much to learn when you come to a new company. There's all kinds of new technology and ways of applying them, uh, new pieces of architecture that you have to understand. And Clojure is a pretty small part of that. So, so I would not discourage people um, from just looking for great generalist developers and teaching them Clojure. It doesn't take that long. Um, and uh, most of the people um, we've had in the company that we've taught Clojure end up really liking it. Um, even some people who might have initially been more excited about the company in, in this space than the technology. So uh, what happens when you uh, build a company and have a lot of people um, creating a lot of closure, right? You get a little bit beyond. A lot of people um, start with closure and they sort of never get beyond like you know, one project where all their stuff is, right? But what happens when you have a really, really, really big code base with lots and lots and lots of closure code, right? This is, this is, a, this is our actual um, uh, screenshot from, from GitHub. And you can see this is, this is something um, at pretty significant scale. Um, by the way, I used GitHub for like two years before I realized if you click that uh, colored line on the bottom, it shows you the language distribution. So um, I'm sure everyone else already knows that. But, uh, uh, but you can see we're, we're absolutely dominated by Clojure. That is, that is our core language. Um, we have a few kind of third-party shell scripts that, that we've mirrored in there. So the actual number is probably well above 80% uh, in terms of the overall code, code that we write. This is a lot of Clojure code. Uh, and it's spread across about 100 projects. Um, so you might be thinking to yourself, wow, there was this one time I used uh, this closure project that had five or six different projects connected, and that was like the worst thing ever because I had to constantly like be jumping around projects and version bumping and line installing, and uh, I hated everything. Like I sort of lost all my joy for closure trying, trying to manage that. Um, and that's a pretty common experience. This doesn't work very well, right? So, so in this model, you can imagine like each project has its own, um, you know, say GitHub repository and its own project CLJ. Um, and so you have these kind of like 
dependencies across these different repositories that have different version spaces, uh, and you have to manage these sort of version sets on top of them. So you're constantly bumping versions, and, and, uh, and it's really, really difficult to manage, and uh, Clojure's tooling is not awesome here, right? Running line install is usually not something you expect to finish in um, one or two seconds. Um, so one response to this is we could say, well, let's, let's just build a monorepo. Let's take all the code that we would normally put in its own individual libraries and just like put it all in one place. So let's go from 100 project CLJs to one. And that solves part of your problem, right? There's, there's a simplifying effect there, which is now I don't need to like, you know, do all these separate line installs and version bump and all that kind of stuff. But now like everything depends on everything and I've just got this gigantic blob of code. And, and that's, that's probably not better. Um, so we wanted to have uh, a mixture of both. We wanted to have um, the good parts of a monorepo, but with the, you know, with the structure and the, and the, the you know, properly uh, dependency smaller versions of the project. So, so we ended up actually having to build a piece of infrastructure here, um, Line Monolith. Uh, it's open sourced. Uh, I'd encourage you all to check it out. Um, and what Line Monolith is, it allows us to do um, is have a single monolithic repo, um, but within that repo to have all of the different projects. So, so this kind of gives you a little bit of the best of both worlds, but you need tooling um, to make that sane. The stuff that comes out of the box with Linigan, it's got some nice features, things like checkouts and, uh, and other things that some of you may have used, but uh, managing that manually is, is a real pain. You end up writing lots of shell scripts, and um, those don't, don't work well as your project scales. And you know, when you've got 100 plus projects, it's really important to have good tooling around that. So we built it. Um, and, uh, and this has been working uh, remarkably well for us, so I imagine this is going to, to continue being um, a technique that we use for, for a long period of time. Um, so, so what does a project look like, right? And, and don't panic by seeing the word snapshot, right? Like many people are programmed to see snapshot and go, snapshots are bad, right? When, with snapshots, uh, we don't know what's going on. Um, but because all of your code is in the same repo, um, you don't need this sort of meta, uh, uh, meta version set notion to tie everything together, right? Because everything is versioned together um, naturally and atomically uh, in the code repository itself. Um, so it's actually perfectly fine, and, and, and in fact, this is our best practice to have all of our code inside that monorepo um, utilize snapshots. So you can read up a little bit more. Um, we have an entire presentation on the line monolith that you can, um, that you can check out offline, but, uh, but I do encourage you to use it if you have lots of projects and you want to keep your sanity. Uh, so what tools are people using, right? You're a big closure company with, uh, you know, 100 plus projects. Like, do these tools work? Do these tools scale? So uh, most of our company is using Emacs plus Cider or some other editor. Looks like its image is not loading, sorry. Um, OK, fine. Uh, <laughs> uh, a couple people are using Cursive. Um, and, and I've got good news. Uh, everybody is happy. Uh, so, so no matter what tool set people are choosing, um, they're all really happy, and all this stuff works at scale. Um, so you can just choose what you like. Um, you don't need everybody to be using the exact same tools and technologies. Um, everything, everything works together harmoniously. So you, you do have a big decision to make when you start a company around what language to use. Um, arguably a bigger decision, not unrelated to the language decision, is what's your architecture going to be? And classically, the decision you have to make as a startup is monolith or microservices. And again, as with the sort of Ruby to Java assumption, some people think, oh yeah, you start off um, with a big pile of crap monolith, and then you know, eventually when you're a real company, you switch to Java and do a bunch of microservices stuff, and then you've got 100 people, and you, and you find a way to make it work. Um, and, and I don't think that's generically bad advice, right? So, so what happens if you choose microservices instead of monolith, right? You've got a lot of stuff that you now have to figure out. So first and foremost, what does that even mean, right? Microservice. There's not like a canonical dictionary entry for microservices. A microservice is a project of this exact size um, that talks to other, like what? Um, how big is a microservice? I don't know. There's, there's a, a lot of opinions on that. Um, you have to figure that out, right? If you're going to structure your brand new project as a microservices project, you better define micro uh, and pretty fast. Um, and you better get it right, too, right? So is it nine or some much larger number? I, I don't know. Um, you got to figure that out. Uh, how do they talk to each other, right? You're going to build this big ball of services and everything's going to talk to every, like, uh, I don't know, over the network? That's not, I mean, that's not good enough, right? You have, to, you have to answer a bunch of very specific questions. If you take any arrow representing a communication from one service to another, um, what is that arrow, 
right? You can't just say network. You can't just say REST. You can't just say HTTP. Like, what's in the payload? Like, what format is that specifically? Uh, what happens when that format changes? Um, you know, how do you know which version of a server? There's just all these really, really difficult problems to solve. Uh, and we're not, like, solving any interesting problems here. This is just, like, plumbing. Um, this is very different, right? When, what's the answer to this question uh, in a monolithic architecture? It's a function call, right? That's, that's very straightforward. Um, so, so this is an explosion in complexity. Um, okay, so how am I gonna deploy my stuff? If I'm deploying a monolith, uh, there's like one thing to worry about. I take the monolith and I put it on that one thing, life is good. Um, you know, if I decide that based on my defini definition of microservice, I have nine different things to deploy, like that's a big multiplier. Like nine separate deployments, um, that means nine different machines, right? Like that's, that's a whole bunch of overhead operationally. Um, that's, that's not insignificant. And that's not even the whole story, right? Because um, as you scale a company, you're not gonna just have a production environment in somebody's laptop. That doesn't work at all, right? You're gonna have all these other environments for um, testing and pre-production testing and, uh, and development itself, and it's gonna explode in complexity. Uh, you're going to have a bar much larger number of things to manage than, than, than most people um, think when they first start. Um, and you need to be an expert in managing that many things uh, if you want to do that. Um, so uh, if, if your pager goes off and, oh man, there's an there's a urgent software patch that needs to go out across you know, 50 different servers and uh, you don't have the expertise and the tools and the infrastructure in place to do that, uh, you're not being responsible in choosing a, a microservices architecture. It's actually possible to do that when you have four things across different environments. You can go and do that manually, uh, and if that's, if that's as, as, as far as you can get in terms of your tool set, you should stop there. Um, management is not just about applying configuration changes, it's also about understanding the state of your infrastructure. Um, right, if my staging environment goes down, like it's in a monolithic architect, that's obvious, right? Well, the staging environment's down. Everything's down, so I don't know, restart it. Um, in a microservices architect, everything's really spread out. Like, where's the problem, right? Why is the service not working? I don't know, this service looks fine. Uh, you gotta like sort of trace down. So, um, so it's very difficult when you just have a larger number of things to manage. And again, nine is not a small multiplier. It looks fairly clean on a slide, but it's a huge explosion in complexity and you need a very different category of tools and a very different caliber of, uh, of administrative personnel um, inside and outside of engineering to make that work effectively. And the cloud will not save you and the vendors who say whiz, whiz bang, platform as a service will not save you either. Uh, Failure tolerance, this is really important, right? If I go from um, four things that can fail to 40 things that can fail, uh, that's, there's, it's much more likely that I'm gonna see failure, right? There's more things that could fail. Even if those are smaller machines, um, that doesn't change the probability of failure in aggregate, right? They're still different machines. Uh, so, uh, so your probability of failure goes way, way up, right? So you don't get to take as much risk as you can in a monolithic architecture where you can say, you know what, I'm just gonna hope that that box that it's on doesn't fail, right? You can actually get pretty far with that, it's one box. Um, uh, but when there's all those other boxes, something's gonna fail, uh, and that means that much earlier than you might want to, you have to build in failure tolerance, right? So when you've got, uh, when you've got these different services running on a machine, you're gonna need a copy of them running somewhere else so that when that machine goes, and machines go, this happens pretty frequently um, at large scale, um, even with, with good cloud providers, um, you, know, you, have to, you have to be prepared for that. Now, what most people do is they say, oh man, um, this is really bad. I've got to have multiple instances of things running, um, so I'd better find a way to, to, to pack those together um, so that I'm not spending tons and tons of money. Um, well, the problem is, um, if I'm packing these arbitrary workloads uh, alongside each other, what happens when one thing starts misbehaving, right? So if I put four different services on a single machine and service A starts spinning out of control, um, like that's all of a sudden gonna push all those other services to, to be completely ineffective. Um, right, so you, you need to think of some isolation mechanism, um, and by the way, this is usually what happens next, uh, because all the traffic is eventually going to, um, going to spill the other machine. And back to that sort of management um, burden, like how do I know B's misbehaving because A, right? This is really hard. So you, you need to really, really be thoughtful about isolation. Um, and the answer to isolation is not, you know, Docker? Like, it's, it's, it's more complicated than that because you have to think about um, the intricacies of how these things um, work with each other, and you still need to do things like capacity planning and all these other things that, um, that, that vendors like to pretend you don't have to do. Um, 
So if we solve all those problems, we still have, uh, we still have more complication, like how do I find service A? Uh, that's easy in, in a monolithic architecture. I call service A's functions. Um, here, uh, service A is kind of a moving target. Um, like obviously at this scale with things failing, static configuration isn't gonna work. I can't say, oh, it's like nine over and one down, right? Because um, then some administrator is gonna go patch the OS and oh man, it's somewhere else, right? So I'd have to go and redeploy the static, that's not gonna work at all. Um, some other version starts failing and shows up somewhere else. Um, that's a very dynamic thing, right? And that's, that's dynamic for a variety of reasons from um, boring stuff like OS patches to rolling upgrades and, and more exciting things like that. Um, worse than that, I have to figure out which service to talk to, right? Think back to that degraded situation where um, I have a machine that's, that's, not, that's not working well. Um, like, I don't wanna send traffic to the machine that's not working well if the other machine can service it well. So you can't just round robin this, like that's not good enough. You actually, um, given all the dynamism of, of, of workloads and where they're running, even with great isolation, there's gonna be different characteristics of a service running on a different machine. And sometimes there's just slow machines. That's a thing that happens um, uh, despite trying to have consistency in your architecture. So you need something much more complicated than choose one at random. Um, and that adds still more complexity. Uh, when something goes wrong, again, in the monolith, I don't know, something's acting bad. Let's like pop open our classic Unix tools and poke around, oh, this process seems like it's weird. Let's go, um, let's go and fix that or restart. Easy. Um, not easy when you have lots of, lots of different machines. So you just, you need a completely different approach to managing it. So, uh, so obviously, uh, using microservices as a startup is a terrible idea. Um, you definitely should not do it. You have to solve all those problems. So of course, that's exactly what we did. Um, and, uh, and that's how I know about these problems so well, by the way. Um, just kidding. So I, I do wanna tie this back to Clojure because um, Clojure's not gonna save, save you from anything I just talked about either. Um, you, know, you might make a choice of some Clojure library that makes some of those choices for you, but you still get to deal with all the implications of those choices, even if they're not choices you have to make. Um, and one of the greatest things, one of the things that I, I think people really love about Clojure is the amazing workflow. Um, and, and as we talked about earlier, right, a startup's gotta move fast. Um, you wanna have things that are reply and dynamic. And, uh, and when you split things apart, you end up with situations like this, right? Where you've got a whole bunch of terminals and in order to run the system, I've gotta run a REPL for each service, get everything where, oh man, I've got like some leader not available thing up in the top left, that doesn't look like fun. So I've gotta get kind of everything working in my local environment. Um, and that's too much, right? That, that kind of breaks the benefit that you get from workflow. Uh, so so when, we were, when we were building this, we said, look, we, we don't want to lose the value of closure and dynamism and REPL-oriented development um, uh, while we're building in a microservices architecture. Um, so we went through a few different waves of, of trying to solve this problem so that we could avoid people having lots and lots of REPLs. Um, the first thing we did is we said, okay, let's buy everybody a really expensive laptop um, with lots of RAM, um, and we'll cut that box in half. Half of it will be for Vagrant. Um, and we'll load that Vagrant image with exactly the same OS image that we run in production, right, because you're running Linux, and, uh, and we'll use all the same configuration management stuff that we do in production uh, to provision Vagrant. Um, and there's some really nice properties of this, right? That means lots of people are running your config management all the time. People kind of get used to um, adapting and evolving that. They're running something that's very close to what you're running in production. Of course, a much smaller version of that. Um, and then uh, because they're running what's in production and all the infrastructure there, um, you can also deploy your services just like you're in production, right? So if, I'm, if I've got three services, A, B, and C, I can deploy them um, onto Vagrant. Uh, and then if I want to work on service A, I just fire up my REPL on the host machine and life is good, right? So this actually um, worked really, really well. Um, uh, the problem uh, is that you write more services over time. Uh, and eventually, uh, there's just too much stuff for Vagrant to do. And they don't, at some point, they just don't sell a good enough laptop uh, to be able to solve this problem um, or, or have enough memory. So, uh, so this didn't work uh, at scale. Worked, worked well initially. Um, so then we adapted this, and we built something called the Galaxy REPL. Um, so, so basically what we did is we, we kept the good parts of the Vagrant stuff, so we still provision like the underlying shared infrastructure stuff, but we said, let's not try and run the services there, because that's the thing we keep adding more and more and more of, um, and it runs Vagrant out of memory. So we said, okay, we'll use Galaxy REPL, we'll bring, we'll bring the services back onto the host as opposed to, to deploying them individually um, on, the, on the Vagrant infrastructure, and we'll just kind of run them all in one process. And that'll allow us to scale up, right? So life is good. Now with those six services, um, everything's working in Galaxy REPL. Uh, and 
unfortunately, <laughs> the same thing happens again. Um, you write more and more services and eventually you run out of memory on the host machine. Um, so these were both useful stopgap measures. They still, um, you know, both of those tactics are used in, in, in you know, some cases, but, um, but they really didn't scale completely. So eventually um, uh, you end up uh, at scale in a shared development environment. Um, and this solves your resource problems really, really well. Right now you've got lots of machines that can run your workload, um, but that first word is a killer, right? This is a shared development environment, uh, which means when people are doing development on services, because it is a development environment after all, stuff breaks all the time, right? So you're not actually better just because you have more resource. Now you're sort of dealing with all the, uh, all the costs of a bunch of people fighting over the same infrastructure. Um, so this is not an easy problem to solve, by the way. I don't have sort of a, here's exactly what you should do. I will tell you what we did and it's working well, um, but this was not inexpensive uh, to implement. Um, so uh, the first thing we did is we created a way of doing side-by-side -side deploys. So, so the goal is we want stable versions of the core services. So if I want H to stay stable, but I want to be able to develop it, I can make little shadow versions of H and deploy them um, out onto the same fleet. Um, now you might be thinking, okay, but like, how do you prevent stuff from just calling the old H? Or like, you know, if you change everything to point to the new H, you're in just as bad a shape. Um, uh, so what we have, and, and this is something that, that uh, we get as part of one of the underlying technologies we're using called Finagle. Uh, we're using, you know, sort of the, the, the closure wrappers for Finagle. Um, but basically, um, its protocol, its arrow, um, has a little request header. Um, and this request header propagates through the entire call graph. And, uh, and because of that, for my request, right, so if I am working on service H1, um, I can make a request to service A. And even though the normal path is service A calls G calls H, the stable version of H, for my request, I can make a little override that says, instead of going to service H, for me, and not for anyone else, go to service H1. Um, and that's really powerful because I can work on service H1, um, and that works regardless of who's calling service H, because they're all gonna get rerouted wherever in the call graph they are, because that, that override propagates through the, through the request path. So this is something you have to kind of think about pretty early on. Um, that would be a pretty difficult thing to bolt on if you had just a mixture of microservices written in different languages. Um, but it's really powerful. This is especially useful when you have multiple uh, people on a single service team working together. Um, so typically we use this pattern when you've got a bunch of people who are all collaborating together on H1. Um, However, this is closure and we can do better, right? So if I'm working on service C, um, I can actually extend this and, and, and we've set things up such that I can uh, boot up service C in my REPL uh, on my laptop uh, and I can override the request graph for the shared development environment um, so that it automatically routes no matter what service is calling service C to my laptop in my REPL. So that's really powerful, right? This is sort of, um, now I kind of have the best of all worlds. So I get that, um, that REPL dynamism just for the number of services that I'm working on, um, and I get all the benefits of the shared infrastructure on my laptop not running out of memory. Um, so this works really, really well. It's super expensive. So um, it's something to, to consider, like when, you, um, when you're building, uh, building a company, deciding to use an architecture of this complexity, um, you've got to solve these problems. And, and if you don't, you're not going to get all the benefits and all the leverage of something like Clojure, right? You have to solve these problems. Um, uh, other things that, that we've done that are lots of fun, um, we have administrative REPLs. So these are REPLs that actually run inside the infrastructure. You know, what happens a lot of the times is people like spin up a tools machine on the side of all their infrastructure and they say, throw all the REPLs there, right? And then you've got six developers firing up REPLs and that machine starts on fire and is running out of memory. So, so what we did is we, uh, we built a way of dynamically running REPLs over the same infrastructure where we run our, our service workloads. Um, so those can be dynamically scheduled and then we don't need the tools machine at all. Um, and as things scale out, right, we can run multiple REPLs for multiple developers. Um, we can, you know, sort of scale different services. So in this example, um, service E now has four instances because maybe that needed a, a little bit more weight. Um, and we can design these things um, so that they're preemptible. So if I decide all of a sudden because there's a customer emergency, I've got to spin up the instance count on service E to eight, um, the REPLs are preemptible. So it can boot those out, understanding that those are uh, less valuable than other workloads. Um, so this is great, but uh, remember that, that issue we talked about before with isolation. Um, you know, there's still the, you know, everyone who's used a REPL has eventually like gotten stuck in some infinite loop, right? So if I do that and my REPL's running alongside my services, that's really, really bad, right? So you have to solve the isolation problem. Um, and, and the way that we've done that 
um, is in the simplest way possible. So we use Mesos uh, as our kind of underlying resource manager and a framework on top of that that lets us express um, the components of isolation um, that are meaningful to us, which are mostly around resources, like you can see examples of disk and memory and JVM heap. Uh, and, and basically, this gives us the ability to sort of in an ad hoc way describe how big a workload should be. Um, and so if my REPL starts spinning out of control, I have a fixed limit uh, on how much CPU that can take. I have a fixed limit on how much memory it can take. Uh, and what happens if something exceeds those limits? We kill it. Uh, and, and, and we kill it um, because we've designed the system to be robust to these things. So um, notice this is not an error. This is an FYI, something got killed in production. So this is not something that we want to happen a lot, um, but we've designed, um, we've designed the system so that uh, you know, things are um, isolated well, we've capacity planned, we've done thoughtful planning for each service about what its actual workload requirements are, um, so we feel comfortable killing that, uh, and that teaches us something about how to run the infrastructure. So this is a very difficult thing, it takes time, um, and you have to build that robustness layer in, into, the, um, into the underlying uh, architecture. Uh, monitoring becomes really, really hard um, when you have a lot of things. Fortunately, uh, in the Closure universe, we have something called Remon, and Remon uh, is sort of a power toolkit um, for being able to do really advanced uh, system-level monitoring focused around streams uh, of events. So, uh, so basically, in Remon, you're monitoring as code, and it's Closure code, so that's pretty cool. Um, so, so basically, you know, to be able to do even like relatively simple things, like notify um, when one of our containers got um, got kicked in, in production, um, that can actually be pretty complicated. So Remon gives us very powerful tools to tune alerts, because when you have you know, uh, 100 machines and anything can go wrong anywhere, um, to prevent your alert logs from just being constant, you need a lot of sophistication in how you respond to these things. You need code, uh, and Remon's a great, great tool for this. Um, we also feed metrics in through a couple of other layers, ending in, in Grafana, um, and this gives us sort of big picture visibility. Um, we have about a dozen different dashboards that uh, different people in the organization use to kind of get a very big picture look uh, at the infrastructure, and this is something that, um, that requires a lot of investment, but it's necessary. You have to be able to see 100 things at once to manage Manage, manage your service well um, and have things be robust and reliable. And by the way, you gotta monitor the monitoring infrastructure itself. So we actually have a dashboard where Remon monitors itself. Um, you can see here that even on a very tiny machine, it can uh, handle um, you know, quite a lot of sustained load. Um, it's almost 2,000 operations per second on, um, I think, a micro, uh, micro instance. So um, it's, it's actually a very efficient way of doing complicated things with metrics. Highly recommend. Um, so end by uh, end, end the sort of uh, scaling closure section of this talk by talking about closure script because um, I've been an advocate for closure script in the past and a lot of people are like yeah closure script like does it scale does fig wheel still work you know does advanced compilation work and answer to all these questions is yes closure script is boring it just works and you don't have to like rewrite your architecture every three or six months to like be one of the cool people uh, in the JavaScript uh, in this JavaScript world so um, closure script is so effective. Uh, that you can, it's easy to just forget you're using it. Um, and, uh, and our primary ClojureScript developer had no ClojureScript experience coming in. Um, two months in, said, I'm never going back. So it's, it's just awesome. Uh, so looking back, right, I had a rationale. Uh, you know, I, I thought Clojure was a good language to start a company with. Um, and then we did a lot of work uh, to, to, to sort of scale it out. Um, we've got a bunch of people using Clojure, solving really, really hard problems at really, really large scale. Um, so, you know, did it check out? And, and, and I believe it did. I, I, I do think that we've, um, it, it took some effort, right, uh, as side effects of our architecture to kind of get that dynamic REPL-oriented workflow um, as well as kind of all that large scale and distributed computing, but it still works. Like that's, uh, you don't throw that away as long as you're willing to make those investments. Um, it's simple and data-oriented, absolutely. Um, I think our code base is definitely simpler than it would be had we used another technology. Um, we use macros judiciously, but it's a great tool to have. Um, we probably have you know, dozens of them, not hundreds or thousands of them, but, uh, uh, but it's a very powerful tool for um, simplification um, used well. Um, and smart people want to use it. And again, not just smart people who already know Clojure. Right? Smart people want to use it um, because I think they can understand that there's good ideas in Clojure and it's a good fit to our problem. So I asked people on the team, I'm like, what do you like about Clojure? Because um, you know, that's something that might change, right? It's a little bit different to be using Clojure on the side versus I'm using Clojure every day, six or seven days a week in, in some cases, um, given, given startup pace. Um, what do you like? And, and I think the answers were, uh, were really in line with the original rationale. 
I love the REPL. Like everybody was like, I love the REPL. That dynamism of workflow matters, it's real. Um, you do get benefit from that. Um, and the second thing almost everybody said was immutability, right? So I think it, tr tracing that back to the rationale um, suggests to me that uh, it's been a good fit and, we, and we've been on a good path and I think we're seeing, um, we're seeing benefits of that. Um, in terms of the company fit, um, I think it's also been very good because Closer's data orientation um, fits our own company's uh, data-oriented problem, right? Um, we had a case where, um, because in the underlying uh, processing layers of our system, um, we use immutable versioning, because that's a good idea and a thing that makes sense, um, we had somebody use an API to delete some data that they didn't intend to delete. Uh, and our recovery time was five minutes, right? We just said, okay, well, why don't we hop back, right? Versus a mutative thing where we would have, would have had to go back to yesterday's backup and replay from logs. It was just, it was almost a non-event. Um, and, and so there's some powerful ideas and, and synergies. Um, another thing I'd like to say is um, I think there's a great fit in the culture. One of the things that uh, I was excited about in choosing Clojure, um, and it's not all dollars and cents, I think the Clojure community is a very welcoming group. And I think you know, seeing the embrace of diversity um, and just the kindness from the Clojure community, that represented something I wanted in my own company. Um, and it's, it's nice to be able to Hire from, uh, hire from a pool of people that have already embraced that culture. So that's, that's really powerful um, and something we've seen. We have a nice group of people at our company and um, I think Clojure's helped. So looking ahead, what keeps me up at night? It's really important for me um, that for me to look, you know, so fast forward two years from now, um, if I'm gonna look back and say that was still a great decision, Closure's gotta keep pace, right? We've got to grow the community. Um, we've gotta get more companies using it. We've gotta um, you know, sell it inside companies that are using it uh, on the side and really get it to be a first class thing. Um, this creates ecosystem effects that are good for everyone, right? Um, tools, uh, tools are good right now. They're keeping pace, but our problems are gonna get bigger. The number of developers are gonna get bigger. So we need to continue um, development and continue um, growth. Um, so for me, again, I, I co-founded a company, so, so I have to take a business perspective. This can't be, I like closure, therefore it's the right thing, right? I, I will change it um, if it ends up not being the right thing for the company. So um, it's a fairly simple calculation for me in terms of, um, you know, is this going to work, you know, two or five years from now? Um, and I think it will, but we've got to keep pace, right? There's things that we have to do um, to, to, to make closure work, and there's things that we get back from that because it's powerful and it gives us that flexibility and it gives us a simpler and smaller code base. We get leverage from closure, um, but there's costs. We've got to make investments in closure as well. Um, and that community growth over time will allow us to stay on the right side um, of that. So uh, I've gone a little bit over time, so I don't have time for questions on stage, but uh, I'll be around and I'm happy to answer any questions after the fact. Thanks, everyone.